So here I'm going to talk about two concepts from intermediate macroeconomics that come up a lot in a money and banking class or also a principles of macro class. But basically, this is going to talk about the money supply and open market operations. And then it's going to introduce the, the money multiplier, which is a little bit different than you might see in a principles class because it also allows for currency holdings. Right? So that's what I'm going to do real quick. Um, so first, uh, what we're going to talk about is what's called the monetary base, which is directly controlled by the Fed, uh, which is C plus R, currency and reserves. Okay, So currency can be cash held by individuals, and then reserves are held in the banking system. And usually some percentage of reserves are uh, can't be lent out. Um, they have to be held by the bank, either you know at the bank or in the banking system. And then that could be a per, uh, reserves over deposits. That's called the reserve ratio. Right. And so a lot of times people talk about money is only the currency side of it. People talk about printing money to create money, but a lot of times money is created through creating reserves. Right. So the two together become the monetary base. Now elsewhere I talk about other measures of the money supply, M, um, M1 and M2. This is sometimes called M0, which is smaller than M1, and it uh, can multiply into M1. Right. Another term I've seen is high-powered money. I don't really use that, but this is what the Fed can control. The rest of the time, money can be created by the, that multiple expansion of deposits, right? So in a principles class, you might have seen how a dollar of additional money can be lent and relent through the system and the multiple expansion of reserves, and then eventually a dollar worth of money can become two dollars or ten dollars in the system. Um, uh, and this is going to get to that formula as well, right? So in, in a balance sheet, uh, for the central bank, we have two sides. We have assets and liabilities. All right, a lot of times you've seen this before in a class, but but here we go. Here's here's assets, which is what the bank holds, and liabilities is what the bank, in this case the central bank, uh, must pay out if required to, and that's what they owe. That's what they're liable for. The three main types of assets are domestic assets, or some type of bonds in the Federal Reserve System. A lot of times it's Treasury bills. Um, foreign assets we can call foreign exchange. That could be you know foreign bonds as well. And then in a very simple model, you could have gold. And some countries uh, hold gold as one of their main assets, and that's the basis of, of a gold standard. All right? So the U.S. doesn't really hold too much, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. All right? So on the liability side, you have currency, all right, which the, the is issued, and then the reserves as well. And what's really important is that assets equal liabilities, and if one side goes up, the other side must go up. It's a balance sheet and left and right balance. So in open market operations, if the Fed buys domestic assets, right, so the Fed buys bonds, they actually expand their balance sheet. They'll hold more domestic assets. They're buying them from the public, and when you buy something, you give people money. Basically, the Fed could be issuing currency by giving the public money. That's the way I look at it. They buy bonds, put money in the system to pay for it, and then this side would go up. If they paid cash, for example, then the amount of currency would go up. If they put it into reserves, the reserve side would go up. So adding $100 worth of domestic bonds could be $100 worth of currency or reserves, but they both go up in the same direction. They also go down in the same direction. So selling bonds is how the Fed might reduce the money supply. Okay, so buying bonds to increase the money supply, selling bonds to reduce the money supply. And they're going to do it with the monetary base, but then it's going to uh, multiply into M1 a little bit later. Now, uh, what we're going to see elsewhere is you can do a forex or a foreign exchange intervention. A lot of times you can buy or sell foreign exchange to weaken or strengthen your currency. Okay, so uh, currencies go up and down based on either interest rate parity, which I talk about, um, but also you can have uh, just supply and demand, right? So if a lot of people want your country's money and they're buying your products, your currency is going to strengthen. You might not like that because that could hurt you, right? It could hurt your exports. So you can weaken your currency by buying foreign exchange, right? And, and that turns into an increase in the money supply, right? Um, you can strengthen your currency by selling foreign exchange. And then that would reduce your money supply. Okay, so that's how you could do a foreign exchange intervention. All right. Now, um, one example I talked about, was, you know, from a decade or so ago, China had an appreciating renminbi. They would buy dollars. They would buy foreign bonds, which is the U.S. And then by doing that, they would increase the money supply in China. And then if you know the, what happens to inflation, then you would say that you know, inflation happens. So China bought so many dollars, increased money, it caused inflation in China. Right? Sometimes developing countries have either high inflation or a drop in commodity prices or something where uh, currencies would um, you know, want to depreciate. They'll sell their foreign reserves, they'll sell their dollars, and that will decrease the money supply. Right, so that could be used for foreign exchange intervention. Right, you could also talk about a gold standard, and so the U.S. before the Fed, and before World War One, uh, and, and a lot of other countries pre-World War One had the gold standard, where every 
unit of currency over here was backed by gold over here. You could not increase the money supply unless you increased the gold supply. Right? So finding gold could be inflationary, um, but it, it limited the creation of money, so it could limit inflation. Um, that's why a lot of people today talk about you know, why they prefer the gold standard. But if you imagine before World War I, um, every $20.67 U.S., uh, it was equal to one ounce of gold, right? And so you, you could uh, directly exchange them. So every ounce of gold could be turned into cash and vice versa. Right? And so they have to balance. You can't print money without gold, right? But the main one is open market operations, again, which is the buying of assets to increase money, selling of domestic assets to decrease the money supply, okay? Now, uh, how does that work? Okay, uh, basically it works through a channel like this, or the simplified version, I use this equation of exchange or the quantity theory of money. If money supply goes up, right, because you buy domestic assets and money supply goes up, then it'll work into either inflation or output increase, right? If you're purely classical, you would say uh, output is fixed, so increases in the money supply lead to inflation. If you're more Keynesian, it could be a mix, and the extreme Keynesian says that prices are fixed in the short run, so increasing the money supply increases output, right? And so again, buying by can can lead to an increase in output or inflation or both right the longer chain is that the money base monetary base increases that leads to the money supply increase through the uh, through the multiplier All right now I didn't draw any graphs but but you can use graphs from elsewhere right increasing the money supply lowers interest rates right there's more money more supply so it costs less because interest rates drive investment lower interest rates mean more investment and because that's part of aggregate demand and, and part of uh, the, uh, and also in the LM curve, all right, uh, through the interest rate and the money supply, all right, this part of aggregate demand, it will increase, and then we split aggregate demand into the monetary side and the real side, and so LM curve is uh, basically the, the money increase, and so both of those increase right on other graphs, okay? So either way, you know, you could talk about, you know, what shifts LM right, right? It, it's an increase in the money supply. Well, you can back up a couple of steps and you can say, well, how does the money supply get increased? It's by the buying of bonds, right? Again, investment is part of aggregate demand, and so both of these would lead to an increase in GDP, right? So what about this step here with uh, the money multiplier? How does MB become an increase in the money supply? Right? Now, it should be positive, re positively related, but it depends on this multiplier, right? So Monetary base is currency plus reserves, and then M1, the simplest way to represent it, is currency plus deposits. So in a principles class, you might talk about checkable deposits or something like that, but deposits are bigger than reserves, right, because reserves are only a fraction of deposits. In fact, R over D is reserves over deposits. That's a percentage. That's the reserve ratio, okay? So we're expecting MB to be smaller than M1. MB should multiply into M1. And so M1 is money multiplier times MB. All right, we're going to solve for MB. All we're going to do is move MB down to here. And so money multiplier is M1 over MB. So we put these together. It's C plus D divided by C plus R. All right? but we don't stop there. We divide everything by D. So it's C over D plus D over D, C over D, R over D. All right? And so this becomes 1. And then this I call little c, and that's the currency ratio, right? And then here is uh, currency ratio plus reserve ratio. Now notice that these are their own definitions of c and r. This is not consumption. This is not the interest rate. This is specifically for this example. But 1 plus the currency ratio, currency ratio plus reserve ratio. Now, in a principles class, you might see that it's 1 over the reserve ratio. It's 1 over r. All right, this is a little bit different because it allows for the currency holdings, okay? And so, uh, basically, the more cash you hold, the more, uh, the lower the money multiplier gets. Because remember, the money in the, if you derive this from a principles class, you're basically putting $100 in the bank, and then immediately $90 gets lent out because it's 10% is, is left, and then of that 90, $81 is left out. Um, because it's always 10%, 10%, but nobody really just goes to the bank and puts it in the bank. If you hold cash, that means that the next round of holding money is going to, and lending money, is going to be a little bit smaller. All right, so because each round gets smaller because the money doesn't make it into the bank because people are holding cash, the money multiplier becomes smaller. All right, so if the currency ratio is zero, it's what you may have seen before. It's one over the reserve ratio, but the money mu multiplier falls as C rises. All right. 
So that's the basics of money creation, right? We looked at the balance sheet where the, the different domestic foreign bonds and gold are the assets and then the liabilities are the monetary base. Buying assets means increasing the monetary base and then the monetary base expands to M1 by this multiplier and we can solve for it with this formula and it's basically one over the reserve ratio but when you, when you account for this holdings of currency then the money multiplier becomes smaller.